Welcome to this week's podcast of Kicking It With Kidneys with your host, Cindy Barclay. Hey, Cindy, take it away. Hey, y'all, and welcome to Kicking It With Kidneys, a forum to discuss topics important to the dialysis community and to provide a legitimate platform for those whose voices have historically been suppressed. In our previous episode, the team provided information to help patients with CKD, those undergoing dialysis, and listeners prepare for the future. Panelists gave specific suggestions and information that urged dialysis patients to take control of their future and make choices that will have a positive impact throughout their life. The changes necessary to achieve victory over madness is primarily centered around social, financial, and physical wellness. There are so many factors that influence our financial literacy. So the group made an executive decision to further our conversation about planning for the future. Um, You have some difficult choices ahead and the difference between living with and surviving a chronic illness must be controlled by money and access to systems that provide subsidies for the impoverished. Today, joining us are our panelists, Maria Jimenez, Rita Williams, Sarita Scarborough, and BJ Simone. So BJ, what is the word on the street? Okay, Cindy, hi. Well, as always, our people on the street are gracious to give us their honest and real answers to questions. This week, Our questions were a little difficult for some people to answer. In fact, they didn't want to. So let's listen to what they did have to say. Word on the street with Simone. Hey, Simone. We out here today talking to dialysis patients and we asked them, how much income do you receive monthly? And how are you managing those funds with the chronic illness? Here's what they said. Approximately 800 three dollars um you know it's it, you know it's not enough i mean had trying to manage that you know with prescriptions and transportation it's not enough there's just no way it, a lot of times there are a lot of sacrifices made and it's very hard there are a lot of sacrifices that are made it's very hard how much money i make is none of your business and what i do with it definitely isn't more money, more opportunity. Uh, twenty five hundred. Cutting corners, coupons, uh, being on food stands, um, taking advantages of various programs that can help me with my utility bills and things of that nature. You know, again, every like I said, every week they they give us honest answers. But this week was something for us to really think about when we hear the struggle that many of our dialysis patients are having financially. Uh, And I think that is why we decided to do a part two. The information we shared in our last podcast was so um, full. There was so much information to share that it really makes it, um, I think, beneficial to our community to have a second part to this topic. Traditionally, we need four institutions for an independent community, which we do not have. We need banking, we need hospitals, we need schools, and we need supermarkets. None of those are in our community. Maria, what are some of the medical problems frequently seen uh, due to patients' inability to support financial requests, you, you know, that's needed to comply with their treatment plan? And are patients actively seeking resources and participating in their care. Well, I will say that, you know, the system is built with the interdisciplinary team again for a reason. Um, Of course, patients, um, especially everyone after COVID are having financial hardships, um, but for patients especially, they have to be mindful of what they eat. I mean, they can't go for the dollar menu at McDonald's um, for their life. They also have medications that they have to take on a regular basis. So you've got food that's more expensive, good food that's more expensive, and you've got medications, you know, co-pays and stuff. And some of these medications that these patients are on are high dollar drugs. So um, on an average, hold on, Maria, on an average, 
how many drugs do a dialysis patient take? Well, um, when I admit a patient, you know, I'm lucky to see patients just on two or three medications. Mm -hmm. And I've seen, you know, up to 10, 15 medications. Wow. So th there's definitely a, a medication burden there. And medications aren't free because, you know, our drug companies want to make their money. Um, but it is a financial constraint on our patients, especially when we expect them to be compliant. Yeah, they come to treatment and they do their whole treatment, but they need support at home with extra things that they have to pay for. So I always, you know, I'm doing my job with the dialysis part, but I always lean to my social worker like Rita um, to assist with that. Well, Rita, how do you address the budget challenges and insufficiencies? Um, and can you tell me the difference between SSI and SSID? Okay, I, I don't know the difference, you know. I, I can't, and I'm gonna read it because I wanna make sure I get this correct. Okay. So SSI provides minimal basic uh, financial assistance to older adults and persons with disabilities, regardless of age. And this is done uh, usually through the Social Security office or the state. SSDI, it supports individuals who are disabled and have qualifying work history, either through their own employment or a family member. Okay, so if I didn't have a job, I'm eligible for the SSI. Is that correct? SSI, if you qualify for that, yes. And All you're right. low income. Right. So is it's that very specific? Is that where the first respondent lives? Uh, the one I think he says he has eight hundred dollars a month. Eight hundred. It sounds like, or his he doesn't have a lot of work credits. What they call credits. Yeah. I did find some numbers, and Sharita may have found something different. But I found for 2020, the minimal payment for uh, SSI was 783, not too far away from what our uh, person on the street said. The average for SSDI was $1,258 oh for goodness. a single person. So how are you doing today? I'm doing wonderful. Okay, so back to our budgets again okay i got rent i got eight hundred dollars that's all i have even if i had 2500 which was the highest estimate that we just heard from our respondents you know one lady just told us to mind our business when I, 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 I accept that okay so we got rent we got gas we have water we have electric we have food which has gone up 45 percent since COVID. I don't understand it, but they were already, the patients were already living at poverty level because what is poverty level? About 13,000 a year, something like that? It, it varies on the number of people in your household, but uh -huh. for one household, uh, $17,420. And that's poverty, correct? Yes. Okay, so we got to the food. Now the prescriptions we just talked about most of these patients are on some type of phosphorus binder if they have hypertension. Now, these are the main things that send them into renal failure, but they continue to have, and they will, high blood pressure and diabetics, okay? So that medication, the blood pressure medication and the medication, the insulin, you're looking at about $50 on an average a bottle a month. You're looking at blood pressure medicines anyway from 30 to 50. You got that vitamin D, okay? And there's a renal vitamin that we give all of our patients. Uh, we put up all of our patients on, and they have to have that monthly. Sarita, uh, I need some help. I, how am I going to survive this? Well, based on what you just described and what we heard in our Word on the Street segment, uh, these patients are in a lot of trouble, um, which is probably why you see a lot of non-compliance, because you have to be able to make the math work. And so going back to our budget last in our let from our last segment um you know we talked hey, about can we hold up a minute let's go back to that non-compliance sure. you know traditionally when you say non-compliant it's easy for folk to believe that hey they just ain't doing what they're supposed to do what you're telling me now is that they're not doing what they're supposed to do because they can't they don't have the resources is that what you're saying to me because they can't afford to do what they have to do I mean, you you have, even if you were to take dialysis out of it, you have people, 
that don't even take their diabetic medicine properly yeah. because they can't afford the medication. Hence, if you're not taking your diabetic medication properly, the next stop on their way is to come to see the dialysis clinic as a result of the diabetes in many cases. So they, they, they are doing what they can. And I actually know of a person who stretches their diabetic medication. And so to say that that's not happening in the dialysis arena, I think would be an unrealistic thing. Sarita, and you're, it's, it's very true. We do see that as a non-compliance in the unit, but sometimes it is because they can't afford that $50 copay because they may have two insulins they take and then maybe like a trulicity or something. And that is another additional, uh, you know, copay. That's $150 right there, just in insulin products. So it is like Maria said, very important for the patients. And I don't want to be all up in their business, but when they tell me, Hey Rita, I can't afford my medication. Well, I do have to work on a budget because nothing's for free. Every, every Money does not grow on trees. And that's what they think Rita can go out back and pull the money and just get them what they need. Yeah. And the thing is, it's not everybody has to qualify. I, I mean, and I do the best. There is pharmaceuticals that do help you, pharmaceutical companies that will help you. But you have to qualify under a certain amount of budget. So, yeah, I'm going to have to know your budget. And then we have patients that have, you know, like you said, we work with their budgets and we're working with them. And you're talking about, hey, well, how many people are in your household? Well, it's me and my husband and my son or my daughter that's an adult, but well, doesn't hold, hold pitch up, in. Hold up, hold up, hold yep, up. Hold yep, up, yep, yep, yep. Okay. Did I say something oh, wrong? Yeah, yeah, you did. Wait a minute. Yeah, wait, I wait, thought hold so. Up, hold up, hold up, hold up. Now, are you talking about children? Are you talking about grown folks laying up? Uh, on I'm talking about grown folks laying up well, on the couch. Now, hold up. Now, America should not have to be responsible for you and your trifling children. Well, okay. so I think just, no, 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 no. <laughs> everybody. My mother said when she left the house, everybody else better be going to. Yeah. OK. Yeah. So so you're saying and see, it seems to me that if I'm getting eight hundred dollars a month in a house. OK. And I got uh, my children laying up on me that are grown that should be working. OK. And, and let me do a disclaimer right now. I don't want folks to take away that. All African Americans don't work. We lazy. No, no, no. All minorities don't work, and that we don't want to have anything, and we just sit up on welfare. That's not true. As a matter of fact, most of the people that are on our welfare are not African Americans. Okay, so let me just have that disclaimer. There are a lot of progressive African Americans, but I'm talking about the population of patients that you see with these families because you make home visits. Is that correct? Yeah, I do. And it's it, that is one of the topics when you say, I see that your son is in the household as well. Does he pitch in? And I get that none of your business, Rita. Uh -huh, uh -huh. But I'm saying, okay, so let's work on this. That is a, a very well, wait a minute. topic. It's, yeah, it's none of your business, but yet you want my help. And that's what I tell them. If you want me to help you, I need to be all up in your business. I mean, if we're going to get some help in this house, then we all need to be on the same page. If that means your son has to pay $50 or $200 towards the rent so you can buy that insulin that is you need to live, then he needs to pitch in or she needs to pitch in. Well, that's a whole political thing. You know, yeah. do I agree that my health care or ability to care for myself is dependent on other people in my household? I don't I don't think. It, it should be individualized. That's just, that's just my thought. Yeah. Well, BJ, now you need to help me out. <laughs> I'm having a hard time here. How does poverty affect a patient's socioeconomic outcome? And what are the ways that a person can improve their chance for future success when the odds are totally against them? And I'm not talking about that extra weight that we have in the homes. Um, you got to have some responsibility and accountability with these children. It's, it's time for them to get out as well. So um, help me out here. Well, Cindy, first of all, poverty doesn't just affect your bank account. Uh, just a couple of little quick uh, stats here. Poverty, researchers have concluded that people are three times more likely to have mental health issues who carry unmanaged debt. One of the 
top five reasons for divorce is financial problems. And on many lists, it's the number one reason. And while it shouldn't really have an impact, your financial status also affects your longevity. So it affects so many different areas and not just your bank account. And, you know, your question was, what do you do when all the odds are against you? Well, there are a couple of three things we can talk about in the course of our, our, our podcast today and other things. You can go to the website and we'll have uh, links and tips that you can do under uh, the resource tab. But the first thing you can do um, that you were talking about is when we have goals, and that's what this whole podcast has talked about, Rita's talked about, uh, Maria's talked about, uh, Sarita's talked about, you have to one, have realistic and achievable goals. That's the first thing. What does that look like? How can what you do make your situation better? We're not talking about improved. We had our respondents say they make $803 a month. Okay, even at 2500 whether it's 800 or 2500 that's still disparities. It's know? disparities, but my thing is we can't change the world. We can't. We can change how we individually deal with it, and that's almost piggybacking to what you say. So the first thing is have realistic goals. If I'm making $803 a month, mm -hmm. what can I do to make that better? And, and that's all you got to do is move that needle a little bit individually. What can I do? Would $200 more make a difference? I can probably get that. $2,000 in overnight in one month? Maybe not. $200? Yeah, I can do that. I'm doing something for myself. The second thing is what they call cognitive restructuring. Mm -hmm. That's basically changing the way you think. Because when you are struggling every single day just to yeah. survive, yeah. it changes the way you think. Yes. And so... It's you start to see yourself as a victim. You start to see the world against you. You have to change that. So the first thing is change the way you think about things um, and know that you are empowered. You're not a victim. That is when, you know, as I'm sure, Maria, you can tell me if this is true. If you are talking to a patient and they are beaten down and they can and they're hopeless, no matter what you tell them to do, they can't hear you. No, that's correct. Okay. That is so, correct. So if we can change the way we think, and you, we've heard this from some of our people on the street, you know, they say, this isn't going to beat me. And those are the people who do better. Those are the people right. who are compliant. The last thing is what you said, Cindy, you got to change what you do. Yeah. I worked with a group that uh, supported homeless families. Mm -hmm. And these were people with children. And one of the things that they're, their target was to help them become financially sustaining. Okay. And they did okay. it. What did they do? They said, but they did it. You're saying they did it as a family though, right? So that no, means I'm everybody saying whoever was, whoever was the head of household, they work okay. with whoever was head of household to get them out of homelessness. And that's gotta okay. be your bottom. When you talk about not having money, yeah, one of the yeah. things they did, was what you were saying. They had them, they had to make sure that they were making choices and that their behavior wasn't continuing to put them in uh, a bad place. Case in point, I'll give you an example. If your rent is due mm -hmm. and Aunt Ruby needs some shoes, mm -hmm. what do you do? Pay the rent. You pay your rent and you help Aunt Ruby get her shoes later on. A lot of people, we don't don't do that. They'll they'll take the money that Rita was talking about, their fixed income, their fixed money. They'll do things because other family members ask them to do, their grown children ask them for money. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. they're constantly being put behind. The second thing, let's, another example, we had a, a, a young lady, she had a teenage brother who had a job, but she was the only one in the family that had a car. And we absolutely made it a mandate she not loan her car to her brother. We said, because if your job is dependent on you getting to work and your brother who cannot afford to repair or replace your car mm -hmm. destroys your car, neither one of you yes. can go to work. So we have to start making those tough decisions. And sometimes they're hard. I'm not telling people that it's easy, Yeah, but yeah, you yeah. really do have to make getting your life better a priority. 
Okay. And that means making those hard decisions. So Sarita, help me here. Back to the budget. $800, mm -hmm. $800 to tw even 25. Help me out here. I I've got a problem. I I've got to pay rent. I there's no need, you know, it's, it's nice to have a place to stay, but I'm going to need ba to bathe to keep my hygiene up. Okay. I'm going to need some lights. You know, uh, I also food, uh, especially with dialysis patients. You know, we're talking about good quality foods, you know, making food choices. And oftentimes it is easier to eat out. And in our community, Sarita, we don't have grocery stores um, um, to where we can go uh, where they sell products in volume, if you know what I mean. So we go to the corner stores and, and basically a lot of the products in the corner. Oh, by the way, Sarita, I did come back down in your area. I went there is a Walgreens there. Thank you so much. OK, I'm sorry. They are there. And I see why. Because it's profit. Because a lot of those patients are, need medications. So I see why Walgreens is there. But why is not um, one of the major food chains as far as a grocery store? What is the difference anyway? Sarita, tell me your opinion on that. Give me your analysis. Why is there Walgreens in our communities, but there are no uh, major food chains that sell, sell food in volume? Can you explain that to me? Well, I, I, the, the store is looking at profitability, and I'll give you a good example of that. Um, there was a community that did not have a major store after, I believe it was back then, it was called Rice Food Market. And so a group, group of community activists got together and partnered, um, begged, pleaded with uh, HEB to come to the community. So after probably a couple of years of negotiating, HEB decided to build what they call a pantry. Did you say a couple of years? They had a couple of years before they came. This discussion yes. was going on for a couple of years? Yes, so they decided oh, to build a pantry. And it's it's significant to understand the difference because you have flagships in the suburbs and pantries in the community. The store was so successful, they outgrew the location, they moved to um, what I would say a little more affluent area, but still within the community, built a flagship and closed the pantry. Now, for a certain segment of the community, they're happy. They have the same products that you find out in the suburbs. For another section of the community, they're not so happy. It's, it's not on a major transit route as far as busing is concerned. Um, of course, the products are of, of higher quality, which of course the cost goes up. And I think you also have to look at whether it's a grocery store or a restaurant or even something as simple as a UPS store. Um, there's always a lot of planning in terms of location. And so when you're dealing with the individuals that are determining where these things go, they're putting a lot of research into how much money is in that community, how, what percentage they can take out, uh, the accessibility, and who their target market is. And so it, if you ask me, um, the, the major stores are not, they're not gonna not accept a person's food stamps, but if that's the primary source of the income that the, that the store is receiving, the store won't last long. We need to be self-sufficient in our communities. I mean, this is what I'm seeing around. I mean, the, the, the Native Americans, Hispanics, Asians, they all circulate money amongst themselves, you know. Um, so what do we need to do in our African-American communities um, to have economic inclusion? You know, I always believe integration was all right, but I told y'all desegregation was better. I grew up in a dese desegregated South. Now, what that means to me is that Everybody around me, the, the person that owned the grocery store, the person that the doctors, the lawyers, they were all in our communities. It seems that we've lost that with integration um, because our children are not learning the basics and the foundation of wh what we were built on. I mean, who we are, self-sustaining and self-sufficient. So, I mean, how do I get around this? I mean, you still haven't answered my questions. I, do, I don't think you do. If I think that... Um... The goal of, of being self-sufficient in the African-American community is unrealistic. 
And, and I say that primarily because when we look at, uh, let's just take a population of 100 people and they are all very prosperous and wealthy, they're not bringing that money back to the community. And, and so who then do you expect to be able to, to help if they're taking their money out of the community and not bringing it into the community? You're saying that we don't do business with each other. That's what you're basically saying, right? Is that we don't do business with each other. Absolutely. Well, that's what I'm preaching. I'm teaching uh, that we should train, uh, especially for a dialysis is such concern. That's what I'm pushing, self-sufficiency. You know, instead of going to these clinics, you know, let the clinics and the nurses train you how to do it at home. We need to be more sufficient in our communities so that we can have that grocery store. But you're saying that that's unrealistic? Yeah, I'm saying that's unrealistic. You know, and you were talking about integration and it's, there's an interesting theory out there by a, a criminologist named James Q. Wilson. I think I may have mentioned it to you before, yeah. but he specifically states in his studies and his research that when the suburbs became available, the portion of the African-American community left the inner city and went to the suburbs to become the lower class of the suburbs. The problem in the inner city is that that was previously the leadership in the inner city. So when the leadership left, all you had left was poverty itself and no one to lead. Now, and I've been listening to a lot of stuff you were saying, I don't wanna go backwards too far, but I even look at the situation where you say a grown kid living in the house. OK, mm -hmm. and I think Maria got real close to the answer when she said some of this is political. But let's say a grown and I'm going to call a grown kid, a 21 year old yes. has an yes. incident at 17 or 18 involved with the law. Now he has a record. But you're saying grown kids need to go get a job. Now, yes, that's what I said. Do, depending on what the violation was. He or she may not be able to. Now, that doesn't mean he can't cut grass or do some things along that line, but being a traditional contributing member to society may not always be the case. And, and I think BJ can probably help me out a little bit more, but I just wanted to throw all grown kids don't live at home because they're just lazy and don't want to work. In some ways, they've been stigmatized by the system. Mm. BJ? I agree. I agree that they have been stigmatized, and, but it still kind of goes back to I that we have to start looking at our situations individually. We're talking about these global things. If we started with in our own families, making sure, yeah, our children are against the odds. There are odds against them, and especially if they are poor. But it's achievable. We can make it. We it made was it absolutely achievable. It tougher times. It's yeah. absolutely. I was having a conversation with uh, a family member, and we were talking very similar to this. Uh, and they have the same attitude you have, Cindy. They say, you know, we were doing so much better when we were basically segregated. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But the reality is every time we have segregated historically in this country, every mm -hmm. time we've segregated and the community's done well, mm -hmm. it is targeted. Mm -hmm. And we, it's not a history course, but, you know, again, we can give you text and verse of what's happened to black communities that were thriving economically. They become a threat mm -hmm. and they somehow, through various means, are, are disbanded. Mm -hmm. So at this point, I don't think segregation is where we want to go. Pluralism is the way to go where we exist. I'm not ever sure there's ever going to be any comfort in us being separate, but equal. Mm -hmm. But, you know, we don't live. First of all, society as a whole is becoming yes. more global. Yes. yes. So yes. not even America is able to segregate itself from the world. And there's no point in us as African Americans trying to segregate ourselves anymore. We have to be proud of who we are. We have to be sustaining. I agree with you on that, but we have to learn to work within the system and we have to beat the system at its own game. Well, work the right way within the system. Work I, the right I, way with the system. I, I, and I we are. To the Gucci and the Pradas and all that stuff. That's not, you know what I mean? We need to know what is value. 
How much are you worth? I agree with you. you know, that's what, how that's much are you worth? You know? That's what we're saying. Have those realistic goals. Maybe having a Prada or having a, a Gucci bag is not a realistic goal if you are making $800 a month. That's not realistic. But teaching our kids, being feeling good about yourself and dressing the best you can and knowing, okay, yes, I have a Walmart bag, but I have money in the bank. I, and uh, just saying, we kind of need to go back to fa our basics and family values, valuing our families, valuing our cultures, valuing our traditions. I think sometimes we go too far in advance and we miss out on something and our children don't have those roots that they had before. But that's what we're missing out on now, Rita. I mean, to me, um, and I'm not against integration. I don't want anyone to take this away from the show. But when we integrated, African-American culture was not taught in schools. You know, families are not, you know, the population of families that didn't teach their children at home to begin with didn't have those community resources and um, right. community places there to help them. How do you do it as Latinos? You guys have, have done what very well as far as supermarkets and things of that nature. What we do is really we stay close to ourselves. We depend on ourselves. I mean, we all work very hard. We work together as a group. And, and like BJ says, we make those sacrifices. We may not have the brand name purses and, and clothes and stuff like that because we value other things. We value, you know, moving ahead, having that house, having some money in the bank. You know, if, if we're not documented, having being documented, being able to do all that. Wow. Sarita, I'm back to you, Sarita. Okay. I'm still looking for some help, sweetheart. I mean, you've told me and what you said made sense. Okay. They've got records or whatever going on and and so they have to be there they don't have a choice it's unfortunate but since there are extenuating circumstances what do you re recommend about those that are there i mean there's well, ways I, to make money okay. th there are but i i think the first thing that that they need to do is um they need to understand that as crazy as this may sound your budget should be relaxing because it really allows you to get into something that you can control. You can't control every dollar that comes in or out of your accounts, but you can control and tr how you track your money. You know, so when we talked about those expenses in the last uh, episode, the point of that was to get the, the listeners to understand how much money you were spending and where you're spending it. And that's the month long exercise because you can't just look at it for one week and say, okay, now I have an idea. You and and budgets, believe it or not, they're always evolving. They're not, you know, you may have a 12 month plan, but something comes up and you have to rework the next three or four months to accommodate for what you needed to deal with in that particular situation. So what you keep talking about is income. And there's a, a difference, first of all, between the gross and net. And that's a critical situation right there, because if we define the gross, when we talk about this gentleman's $800, is that gross, meaning what comes in monthly, or is that his net after all the deductions are made? And that would really make a big difference in the budget itself. Now, to try to get to where you're going, there are things people can do. They can, and especially in this digital age, they can work from home. If they have a, a special skill, in many cases, I have an in-law that actually can sew very well. Now she's not sick, but she actually sells her products on places like Etsy and things of that. So just because you can't go out and get a physical job, you can take the skills that you have and do something with them. If you are able to get a physical job, then certainly a part-time job or something would be in the lineup. Um, nowadays, you can set your own schedule. Like if you work for Uber or Lyft, if you're able to drive, you can go on for two or three hours at the set time that you want to, to bring in that additional income. You know, that really sounds good because nowadays, you believe it or not, you can't even get people to work. They're having a hard time getting people back into the employment 
arena because of the extra uh, monies that the government is doing to, sub to kind of uh, jumpstart their economy. Okay. Well, that's, so that I sounds a little Republican to me. I, I don't uh, subscribe uh, to that. Uh, I don't subscribe to you, that. Ooh, don't let me. Uh uh. Y'all help me here. Go ahead on, Serena. I'm, I'm going to go ahead on. So I'm not a Republican, I don't, but okay, so, girl. Uh, well, but that's something that they're constantly, that party is constantly okay. saying. And, mm -hmm. and that's what they want people to believe. So okay. I saw the same thing on the news that you're talking about. There's, okay. uh, there, there's more jobs than people. But when I researched that, because I was curious, if there's a job out there, mm -hmm. I want to know what it is and what type of job it is. And what okay. you're talking mm -hmm. about are service industry jobs, such as waitressing, um, uh, the grocery stores, stocking. And I'm not saying that people should be above or below that. A waitress gets paid maybe, and somebody help me if you know, it's like- It was like 213 or something like that, but they expecting you know the bulk of your income to come from tips, but don't nobody have the money to tip no more. That's Absolutely. right. Absolutely. And Absolutely. so when you say that they're staying home because they make more money at home, I, I just fundamentally disagree with that. Well, Sarita, 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 can you, because I really believe we can help uh, members of our community, would you either recommend or maybe put a form on our website for, you know, just basic budgeting? Because I, I the, and the reason I say that is I started to make a budget very early on and I, I used some websites that were free budget websites, but it makes a huge difference when people Simple. see that, you know, I'm spending $20 for cable, I mean, for a Netflix and, and how over the course of time, that's over $200 out of my budget. So maybe a form for people who don't have regular access to the website, or if you know of a simple budgeting tool that people can use so that they can, you know, when they spend things, they can put it on there and keep track of it for that month. And I'm really hoping that our, our listeners will take you up on that month challenge. Sure, I'll get that to you. And that, that's one thing that we, we haven't gotten to. But if they are computer, have access to the computer through their public library or some of the other uh, community centers, you can also look at Microsoft Excel, and that is also I saw a tool. That, Sarita. That's a little complicated, though. We want basic, you know, something okay. really basic for them because some of those things they have it there, like spreadsheets, but they're somewhat complicated when you basically have limited understanding about, you know, funds. Period. You know. Well, when we're talking about the budget, Sarita, I know you've mentioned a lot of stuff, but I was going through some of the budgeting items that I do do with my patients and sometimes things that they have to consider cutting out or, or you know, uh, moving to different plans. And some of those were like... Uh, reducing the utilities, you know, maybe you could switch and go to a different utility company, maybe a cheaper uh, cell phone plan. Maybe you don't need the one with all the bells and whistles and come down to a, a basic plan if that will fit your stuff. Stop isn't, eating Sarita, out. Sarita, isn't, I mean, uh, Rita, isn't that even political? Because there are certain geographically, mm -hmm. these, uh, the even electricity, of utilities is split up in different regions. Yeah. You don't even have an option, right, Sarita? You don't have an option to go somewhere else, do you? Well, you do, but you do have options. And But realize a lot of times with the utilities, it's all based on credit. And to suggest, even though this may not be true, but in the case of the $800 gentleman, if that's his gross, I wouldn't be surprised if he wasn't on a prepaid plan, which we know that that's more expensive than, say, a traditional utility company. You know, I, I think that, that one of the things is that this whole budgeting credit and all of that is almost a course that needs to be taught. Yeah. You know, because all of it, you know, meets at some point, which is what generates that total success that we're trying to get them to. Okay, so Maria, can you share some of your medical, um, some of your experience that you've had with patients uh, that are struggling and that are coping with limitations and restrictions 
um, such as medications and um, just overall frustrated and cannot be compliant with their plan of care because of, of resources. And even transportation is an, is an issue. They come in frustrated. So can you share some of those experiences with me and how to get around um, and how to help them? Sure. What, what, would I, what I would say, what I personally see more with my patients, again, we do staff assisted at home where the nurse comes to the home. So most of our patients have a one-on-one -on -one education and have the ability to um, be more compliant and, you know, with their treatment plan. Um, so I don't see those in-center patients that have, but everybody has financial issues. And, um, you know, our social worker is really good at getting resources for those patients. So what I would say is the compliance on our end is, is not as much financial other than what they're going to do and what they're not going to do. They have access to get the medications, especially their phosphorus binders. Um, but they, you know, rather eat what they want and take their binders, you know, sometimes. But a lot of the support or efforts that, you know, get them to be more compliant is transplant team. We all, I always tell them, look, if you're wanting a transplant, transplant wants to make sure that you're compliant. And that's with taking medications and that's with your treatment, following up with your physician. Because why are they going to give you a kidney if you're already non-compliant, um, you know, and it'll be another waste. So, And, and although the, we know that getting a kidney is not a cure. It's, it's, it's the best treatment option available in that Correct. you can have some type of normalcy in your life. Is that what you're saying? Correct. Because that still in itself comes with medication, anti-rejection medicine that you'll have to take after that. So if you're not taking your phosphorus binders, your blood pressure meds, your insulin or oral um, diabetic medications, what makes them think that, you know, you're going to take your anti-rejection every day. Like I said about that patient in one of our earlier episodes, young girl, dad gave her uh, the kidney, stopped taking anti-rejection medications and lost the kidney. So it's what I see um, to answer your question more is not necessarily a financial hardship, um, even though it is an issue, um, but it's more so them not doing what they're supposed to do just because. And, and well, and like Maria said, working as the IDT team together, Maria and I and the dietitian and the doctor, we all work together with that. So if something does come up, Maria usually knows before I do. And like I said, we work together and try to get those resources available to those patients if they qualify for them. So a lot of times patients okay, will come in. You just said a key word, if they qualify. Well, if they qualify. right. The bottom line is that if I'm on, a, you, I think Maria mentioned three or four medications, but on an average, what I've seen is right. five or six medications. You could be right. on three blood pressure medicines. Yes, medicine. I've you seen that. You could be on two types of insulin. Okay. So are you saying that Medicare or Medicaid or a group health care plan is going to reduce the cost of that for you? No, and I'm talking about other resources in the community, like pharmaceutical assistance, working with the pharmacies. And if, like you say, if you don't have Medicaid, the state insurance that also assists, and if you qualify for Medicaid, applying for services like that. So like Maria says, there's no tree I can reach into, but I can advocate and look for resources in the community. And sometimes patients bring resources to us. I mean, I had one patient that brought me, uh, that informed me about a church that was giving away medication. And it was, you know, and uh, I guess they were recycling, uh, something like that. It was a medical professional there as well. But okay. they were. So I was yeah, going to say, I don't know if that sounds, there. recycling medications, they're yeah. doping yeah. themselves, yeah. and that didn't yeah. sound very good. But yeah, yeah. If there's no, a no, medical there, professional yeah. there overseeing that, I understand. There is. I mean, where in my previous hometown, that's yeah. what they did. They had. Um, I don't know if it's recycling, it, but. <laughs> no. Repurposing. What they did is they actually did have like uh, pharmaceutical reps that had right. extra medication. Yes. Um, if people, if there was someone who wasn't using their medications, let's say, God forbid, a hospice patient, uh, and they donated the medicine. It was good medicine. It hadn't expired. And like you said, it was there was a, a physician there, a nurse there, a social worker was there. Um, so they had other people that were there that supervised. And they would have volunteers to come in and collect the medication and log it in and right. categorize it. 
And when people came in that were more vulnerable people of the community that didn't have other resources, it was actually a, a health center working for the working poor. So these right. are people who worked but didn't have mm -hmm. any benefits. Yeah. Those those waitresses that don't have benefits in their job, right. but they're working and they, um, so yeah. yeah. Those are not traditional resources no. that I would use, but when patients bring that up, I do take note of it because they may at one time need that. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we just have to go outside the box a little bit to assist our patients. So I heard, I've heard everything that everyone is saying, Sarita, and how can focusing on low income patients, because that seems to be the problem. That seems to be the problem with a lot of medical disparities and disparities in general, not enough money. Um, and too many people that need help. So how can, what can we do on Kicking It With Kidneys on our show to improve their economic status when they have little or no financial um, cushion? There, there's no cushion there. Well, I don't know about improving their financial status in that way. I think through the forum that we're providing through education, like what BJ suggested, giving them sample templates that they can use and continuing to educate about how to uh, manage what you have and then slowly grow to meet the goals that you set forth over a period of time. And those extra additions uh, that you have at home, because I have seen some of that, okay? Um, and that's whether a person is on dialysis or not. I got a few family members that I want to disinherit. You know what I mean? Okay. Um, and I think it goes back to like where you mentioned the utilities. Um, yeah. There's some people that they don't even know how to compare utility companies and services. You know, you're looking at kilowatt hours versus this, yeah. that, and the other. And, and so, those are the things we have to educate about. Um, there is a site um, called Power to Choose, I believe it is, where you can go in and, and answer a few questions and it'll tell you everything in, in that specific area. And I'm, I'm saying utilities, it may offer other services as well um, that can help them save money. One of the new trends that I've been seeing is people who cannot afford cable have they just purchase internet and they go with devices such as Roku and things of that nature. And they're watching the same amount of TV for a considerable amount less. But now whether they have internet at home is a whole nother question. Yeah. And those yeah. people are just kind of cut off from the world other than their cell phone. Um, cell phones have taken over from an economic perspective. When you look at it, it's a choice now because you're telling me about um, cell phones, okay, with access, and they're making a lot of money. They're making a lot of money. Don't you think that that time would be better utilized or, or that money would be better utilized if we look at the household income? I mean, what did people do before cell phones? Or do, do, you, even, do you remember, Sarita? What did people do before cell phones? Oh, we wrote letters to people. We, you know, we had a lot oh. of things to do. But, but Ms. Barclay, let me, again, I'm going to, I'm going to have to, to tell you now, when you're looking at people with cell phones and you're talking about low income people, there's services for that. When you okay. walk in, in Walmart, you know, there are the prepaid services. You have Cricket. That's, these are not contractual cell phone services, which again, you have to ask the question, is this at the end of the day more expensive than a traditional plan? Why can't you get a traditional plan? Probably goes back to credit or lack thereof, because in some instances, they don't have bad credit. They just have no credit. What do we do, Sarita? Ms. Barclay, I think, I think that even exploring that topic would probably take so much time. Let's, let's talk about the community that I would call the tray, which is where I was born and raised. OK, when my parents bought into that community, they bought that house for thirty thousand dollars. That was a lot of money back in the early 60s. OK, 
in that same neighborhood today because the people that um, went out to the suburbs have gotten tired of driving. In mm. that same neighborhood today, you can't buy a house over there for a half a million dollars. Okay? So my point is this. What, when you oh, say- so, so, wait a minute. So you don't live in the hood. You know, wait, wait, hold up. I just got you. No, you've been talking to me about Miss Bartley come down to the- So you, I said where I grew up. No, I, I know where you live. I, it doesn't mean that I don't still live in the hood. I just okay. said the home in it's which just, I grew up. Oh, don't try to check me now. Okay, all right. All right. <laughs> okay, because you keep getting on me talking about come down to the hood. You living in, and I know it's your parents and all, okay, but uh, mm, go ahead on, Sarita, I'm but, sorry. But Miss Miss Barkley, what I'm saying is, and, and B, I, BJ, you'll have to correct me if I'm wrong, but what I see is that our communities have been cut, sliced, divided, and shifted. And so when you say, home ownership and community. If we take the example of Fourth Ward, which was the original uh, Freedman's Town in Houston where African-Americans of all income levels are, they, they would went through a gentrification process and the people living down there look like me, you, Rita, and every nationality, but there is no place where, where it's just Hours as it was, and because owning a home is one thing, but hey, let's let's talk about the children that their parents left them a lot. They may not not know about credit. They may not know about paying property taxes, property insurance. They don't want the place, so they sell it, and then here comes a whole new community buying the properties of the, the people before. And that's what I say, it gets, you, you're trying to fix something that has been broken for a significant period of time. And you also talk about the educational component. Well, I'm watching the news and there's a, a bill in the legislature in Ohio right now that is trying to take out of classes, teaching anything about race and as this, a uh, Republican representative describes it, anything that may make a child feel uncomfortable. Well, why would talking about race make people of color feel uncomfortable? Because it's our history. Are no, they but they're, talking about they're teaching to all students and not just people of color. See, we've been fighting traditionally to get included into the history books. What this, okay. this legislator is trying to do is take us out of the history books. Are you trying to say out of sight, out of mind? You know, we are- I, I, I am. We are a resilient people. You do know that, right? Well, I, I'm not arguing that, that point. Resiliency uh -huh. has nothing to do with it, but if you keep breaking down and breaking down, you have BJ over there talking about positive reinforcement, and trying to encourage people through all the mechanisms that they offer on the social services. But if you keep breaking people down, 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 how long does that resilience last? That's why I keep talking about the difference between integration and desegregation. You're because not we, we're not maintaining that value. Because again, you know, I remember when I was a little girl, my mother would go out in the backyard and pick some herbs that they're now packaging for a bunch of money. Okay, she would pick those herbs and she when we got sick and she would boil them and we'd, we'd be all better. You know, those are some fundamental values that has a lot to do with cost. You know what I'm trying to say? Yeah, Cindy, I agree that we have to learn more about our history, learn more about our heritage. I agree that that's important, but being segregated, mm -hmm. I do not agree that that's the way to go because I don't think that's gonna sustain us. I don't think we can find a little island. They've tried that. It's called Liberia. It didn't work. Mm -hmm. So that's just not the way the world is going. On, on the other hand, what we do see are political forces that are yeah. making policy, mm -hmm. that are enacting laws and rules that are pushing us back. Mm -hmm. So we have to be mm -hmm. careful about how far back we want to go. Right. So a seat at the table. We need that seat at the table that we I've been talking about. At the table, about. I agree, but we need to be prepared. 
when we okay. get to the okay. table too. Okay. Yeah, okay. we have to have questions at the table. Yes. You know, not just the seat. My, my we, we're coming too, Cindy. Yeah. Oh, okay. We're all coming. But my father said coming. to me, um, it is better to be prepared for an opportunity that doesn't come mm -hmm. than to have an opportunity come and you're not prepared. And the first thing that we have to do as it relates to kicking it with kidneys is getting mm -hmm. healthy. Because right. unless right. our community gets healthy, there won't be anybody to sit at the table if they offer us a chair. And That's like you true. say, not just uh, and educate our, our mm -hmm. kidney, with kidneys uh, mm -hmm. people. We need to get that education out. Like Sarita is saying, yeah. we need to educate ourselves about a lot of this stuff. If we don't know about it, we need to help each other to know about this stuff. So and learn. Learn. So and that's what we're doing. So one of the things I want to say, Zinni, and because it, it was really interesting and it helped me, is you probably don't want to say it, but you wrote a book. Oh, you know, you wrote a book. And I don't, I don't have my copy. So if you have a copy in your office, I do. It's called that damn dialysis. Okay. <laughs> we're talking do. about self-help and we're talking about educating ourselves. I read the book when Cindy wrote the book. I didn't know anything about kidney health or dialysis or, and I certainly didn't know how it related to hypertension and diabetes. Mm -hmm. And so when I read the book, it's a fun book. It's a, a easy to read book, but there were interwoven in the, the fun parts and the story of the book is very vital information. So By the way, I was on Amazon the other day looking mm -hmm. at books and I don't know how this happens, but someone had my book for 980 something dollars. And I'm thinking <laughs> <laughs> this book is sold. It's sold by Clay Bar Publishing for less than um, 20 bucks, okay? Mm -hmm. But the first, what, 50 callers or the first people that go on, what, what is our website? Our website. Okay, the first 50 that goes on our website, they can have the book free, okay? What do they need? They need to go to kickingitwithkidneys.com and the first 50 people will get it for free, okay? But back to our call. Thank you so much, BJ, for talking well, about the it's book. It's a good book. You need to okay. Let okay. everybody know about okay. it. Okay, all right. So, Sarita, I'm still left devastated. Okay, Ms. Barclay, while, while you are getting over your devastation, can, can I help you out with something? <laughs> mm -hmm. I've had a couple of people to say that they weren't able to find you on the website. Yeah. And so I want to clarify to them, okay? Now, for some reason, when it comes to your website, uh, these individuals want to have mastery of the king's language. But when you're talking to me, you say, I say, hey, what you do? Oh, I'm chilling. C-H-I-L-L-I-N. Right. Can you loan me a dollar? Drop the R and just say dollar, D-O-L-L-A. All but right. when it comes right. to kicking, uh -huh. they want to add the G. So for oh, your girl, listeners no. out there, it's kicking. Just like you chilling and you need a dollar. And I'm not going to talk about respect with a K today. It's kicking, K I C K I N, it with kidneys.com. Now go ahead. Are you over your devastation, Ms. Barclay? Well, I'm still, Sarita, maybe you can, because I, I, we want to end it on this show because we've got to move on to other things. But I, this is just, you know, can you guys, all of you, but I'm asking you, Sarita, because you know, you know, you're cheapest hell, you know, you'll squeeze a dollar out of anything. So I'm asking you, how can I stretch my 800 that I'm getting a month or my 2,500, okay, to sustain me and my family, including Bubba and them. You understand what I'm saying? So well, what do you recommend? Well, the first thing again is understanding where you're spending your money and having an honest conversation about are these expenses necessary are they vital? And beginning a prioritization process. We have to know where the money is going before we can address the changes. And we also have to be truthful with ourselves because in, in many cases, there are things that we're purchasing that are absolutely not necessary. So if you've got a young mother that's raising you that has not been educated on finances, okay, and how to plan for the future, and she's going out and she can't afford it. How do we work on that? Do we need the community to, to come together as a whole with churches and teach classes and to get these 
um, these folks better educated because again, I can't give my child what I don't have. Okay. So I, I know I'm talking about self-help tools, but again, if there's limitations with understanding and what you perceive to be important, isn't that right, BJ? I say let's brighten the corner where we are. Okay. I think people who listen to this podcast, we are offering them suggestions. Let's see how that goes. I think this is I think this is a wonderful format for people. And I think our corner is helping the community, the dialysis community, and helping the other people who listen. And I'm still gonna say promote some of the suggestions that we're doing right now. Let's start here. And then the world will take care of itself. All right. Sarita, I need some. Let's go to our questions first. You don't have any solutions for me today, do you? As far as how to handle my eight hundred dollar budget. Well, I, I, yes, there are nonprofit organizations that you can go to that help you work through your budget and the process that will teach you about credit. Um, I also think that that we may lose a generation somewhere along the way mm. before we rebuild the generation. I think that we can look at our banks who. Uh, always want to say about their community partnership and involvement. Um, they need to do more at the, the elementary level of teaching children in the school since these parents don't have the skill sets to necessarily offer that. So I think your activists and people of that nature need to put some pressure on the banking institutions to be more involved at a, a, a K through sixth grade level to be able yes. to start training the children at an early level, just like in the same regard, we need to do more with nutrition in schools. Mm -hmm. See, we, we can't fix grown people, but we can, mm -hmm. we can reset the stage with the youth who have not been tainted. And so that's why I say we might lose a generation of people, but in the end, we'll, we'll have a much healthier, conscious population. I heard um, I went a grapevine that you had a stash uh, somewhere. Um, I just wanted to know if you could offer some support. I mean, I know that there are foundations, but I heard that you had saved up quite a bit of money over the past few years. I mean, you want to help us with? You want to follow Here's some of that? Well, Miss Barclay. I, you know, the grapevine is not always true. But you know we are in the middle of a recession, don't you? Yeah, and but you, know those, you had, you you had money people, before the recession. You know those people I talked about that got money and left? Uh-huh. Okay, I have no problems. I'm sitting here hanging out with my people. But now if I need to get up and leave, I too will do that. Okay? But so no, I don't have no money. I don't have a dollar. Oh, <laughs> No, well, okay, Sarita. I know I'm putting putting all your business out there because you don't want nobody to come looking for you or asking you for nothing, especially when you work for yours, right? Is that what you're saying to me? Not one dollar. Okay, all right. You want all right. some spare change? What did Robin Harris say? Spare that? change, spare uh -huh. up. That's a clean <laughs> version. Okay, so guys, I have questions. Okay, uh, one of the questions comes from. Paula, she says, all I've heard you guys talk about is Western medicine. Aren't there holistic practices like acupuncture and herbs that I can take to cure my kidneys? Well, Maria, what do you have to say about that? Because she's saying all we talk about is, you know, Western we have medicine. To, I'm, I'm looking at scientifically. And, you know, we do have some patients that, you know, do plant based and, you know, all that kind of stuff even though their labs are better, mm -hmm. they're not good enough for them to stop dialysis. So unfortunately, the holistic um, form of medic med medicine that people uh, like to try has not been proven um, in dialysis patients. Okay. So I think the time to, uh, to stop that should have been before uh, holistic and dietary changes in, your, you know, before right. he went on dialysis. Right. The next question is from Pam. She says, is testing kidney function a routine part of an emergency room visit? 
I guess that'll be for me too. Um, a part of your lab panels that they do in the emergency room is your basic CBC, complete blood count, um, CMP, complete metabolic panel. Um, the creatinine level, your BUN is part of those labs that they draw. Um, and so in an emergency situation, yes, they should be able to see whether your kidney function has diminished. Right. They don't know why, you know, at that point, but you know, they can tell that, with those that labs. The room doctor will refer you to some a specialist. Correct? Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. All right. This third one. I guess this is for you, Rita. The person is saying, I don't like my dialysis unit. Oh. Can I choose another one? You sure can. You can go anywhere you want. If you don't like where you're at, tell me. I'll help try. Uh, transfer you to a unit that you'll be happier. I mean, bottom line is we want you to be happy. We want you to be compliant with your uh, treatment. So yeah, you don't have to stay with us if you don't like us. Right. Your doctor has suggested where you right. should go or right. a modality. Um, again, it's just a suggestion. Patients don't understand that they have rights. When I go admit my patients, I always let them know what our grievance policy is. Right. Um, always be vocal. If you don't like something, share it with your nurse or your team. Yeah. Um, and if it's not resolved in a timely manner, then you have options of calling different state agencies. Um, and a lot of patients don't know that. So you that's have right. options. You're not stuck. You have an option. And I think that's great because I think a lot of patients don't understand that they have resources, you know, okay. that they can. And have you have you followed the hierarchy? I mean, if, if there's somebody at the unit that you don't like, then go above them to try to resolve that. Because what you don't want to get is labeled. And I have seen that, Marie. I have seen where patients are labeled because they didn't like something. And of course, I don't know how it happens, but they go to another place and then they're OK. You know, um, I'm not going to condone bad practices. If you go in there running off at the mouth, not listening to the doctor and, and think you're going to run the unit, I do understand that. But if you're not happy, you need to, you already have enough issues going on. So if you're not happy, you should move, okay? And that there are resources that can, the, the social worker, worker um, should be able to help you with that. Okay, guys, yeah, so we're going uh, to, go ahead. Rita, um, question. If I wanted to go to a unit um, to, to be with, a friend of mine and we get on the same treatment or whatever, do I have to change doctors or will the doctor still service me at the new location? It just depends if the doctor has uh, rights or uh, priv privileges at that unit. And if he doesn't, if he's willing to get those privileges. Okay. Yeah. So, well, we're going to sum it up and I need all of you as usual to put your best foot forward and just tell me um, because we're talking about planning for the future. Now, this was our start. Next week, we're going to be talking about labs and things of that nature. But this was our start. And planning for the future, meaning money and practices, you know, best practices. BJ, what do I do? Um, certainly, we know that our choices are really only as good as our opportunity. But we can make our opportunity by some of the choices we make. So that's what we've been talking about. Make your opportunity. Make your opportunity. Rita? The same thing, sometimes just taking a step towards a, a direction, the right direction, even if you have to really take a, a leap just to make a difference, just make a difference and make a change, even if it's a tiny one, but try right. to make a change. Because if you don't care for yourself, don't expect anyone Nobody else. Nobody else you know? is going to help you. You know, there used to be a time when people would come to the rescue and help you and do all that they can. They don't do that anymore. You know, yeah. you've so got to be your own savior now. Yeah. Yeah. And advocate for yourself and you know, advocate for yourself because it's about you. OK, Maria, uh, what I would say to my dialysis patients is to keep in communication. You know that there's support and there's financial assistance nationally. Talk to your social worker. All right. At <laughs> last but not least. Cerrito, what can you help me with? Well, especially, I, I, especially that, especially the guy that makes eight hundred, that's pulling in eight eight oh three or something like that a month. Well, I I would suggest to follow the words of uh, William Shakespeare, Miss Barclay, mm -hmm. and he said, "To thine self say true." One of the things that all of it, whether it's the medical side or the financial side, the first thing is you have to be truthful with yourself and realistic about what your goals are. 
what what is achievable and what is not. And so you don't have to tell me what your goals are or those kinds of things. But when you sit down and put it on paper, it's going to tell you what you can and cannot afford. And then you have to be realistic about how do I get to the point where I live the lifestyle that I want to live and what is it going to take me to get there? And so it all starts with individuals being honest about their situation and true to themselves because you can't help anybody that's not even being honest or truthful to themselves. I like that. You know, we need to find a way out of all these destructive disparities and the solution is education. As I said previously, Native Americans, Hispanics, Asians, all circulate money amongst themselves. Now, Sarita has given me some food for thought in that there are other extenuating circumstances that are, are prohibit uh, primarily African Americans from getting to where they need to be, all right? But in order to have economic inclusion, we as minorities must learn from and educate each other. So we need to learn from the Hispanics and from the Native Americans and from the Asians, all right? Well, that concludes our show. And um, we hope you have enjoyed it and look forward to you uh, joining us next week on Kicking It with Kidneys. Well, that's it for today. Thank you for listening to Kicking It with Kidneys with your host, Cindy Barclay. See you next week. The views expressed on this podcast are educational and opinion based. These are not medical doctors. Be sure to catch us on social media on our website, kickingitwithkidneys.com, also on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube.